You're tuned in to the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. We're sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goal with this show is to help provide a narrative for how individuals, organizations, communities, and cultural groups around Yolo County are weathering the pandemic. We believe the more we can share diverse perspectives and solid local information, the better prepared we are to create community that's based on understanding and inclusion. Highlighting a couple of upcoming interviews, next week we'll talk with Davis resident Melanie Carr about her Tuesday Table Effort, a take-what-you-need approach to sharing needed supplies during the pandemic. On September 8th, I'll host Corinne Modokaitis about the impact of the pandemic on youth sports from her perspective as co-director of Davis Aqua Monsters. And on September 22nd, I'll speak with UC Davis Chancellor Gary May. As of today, Yolo County reports a total of 2,239 COVID cases with 34 new cases reported yesterday, and we've experienced a total of 47 deaths countywide. Just a reminder that face masks are mandatory still in Yolo County. And a reminder to please wear them. Please be considerate and wear them while using drive through businesses. A worker at a Starbucks drive through recently told me that 75% of their customers don't wear masks while getting their coffee, and so the workers are exposed repeatedly throughout the day. Not a good scene. Here's a testing update for our area. An OptumServe COVID-19 testing site launches today, August 25th, and runs through September 20th at the Davis Senior Center, located at 646 A Street in Davis. Testing at this site is open to all California residents, regardless of documentation status, and it's by appointment only. All ages are welcome. If residents don't have health insurance, the cost of the test will be covered by the state. And if they do, it will be billed to their insurer at no cost to them. To schedule an appointment, call 888-634-1123 or visit lhi.care forward slash COVID testing. We all know that COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on the economy. Local job seekers can get can help get back on the path to employment by connecting to job opportunities at a virtual job fair series. It takes place September 1st through 3rd from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. each day via, what else, Zoom. YOLO Works, YOLO County Health and Human Service Agent, Services Agency and YOLO County Workforce Innovation Board are hosting the series, and each day job seekers will have access to up to 10 employers and be able to learn about available opportunities in the area. Over 20 employers from a wide range of industries have signed on, and new ones are being added daily. Sign up for this at YOLOWorks.org. You'll get an email confirmation 48 hours prior to the event, and due to limited capacity, these sessions are for job seekers only. All right, we have our interview coming in, so let's go straight to that. Dr. Larissa May began her tenure as Interim Public Health Officer for Yolo County on August 4th. A professor of emergency medicine and a public health expert at UC Davis Health, she's also a board-certified emergency physician with an interest in quality improvement and patient safety. Her work is often focused on the epidemiology and management of infectious diseases, including best practices for diagnostic testing, outbreak, response, and infection prevention. Dr. May has many accomplishments and awards in the medical field and recently received the American College of Emergency Physicians Quality Improvement and Patient Safety Section Service Award. That is a mouthful. We're very glad to have you here today. Dr. May, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Great. Since the start of the pandemic, I've highlighted interviews with our public health officials, uh, primarily because developments around the virus have continued to shift so rapidly. So I'm really pleased to chat with you. How are you and Dr. Marianne Limbos dividing the workload for the county's public health division at this time? 
So uh, it's so great to have such a wonderful team with Dr. Limbos and um, Brian Vaughn, who's our public health director. Mm -hmm. So very fortunate to be able to work together on this. And um, essentially, I'm half-time, so what we've been doing is splitting the health officer duties um, so that I'm covering the first part of the week and she's covering the second part of the week. And um, we do stay in touch uh, through email and calls as needed. And she's been primarily focused also on our uh, response for schools and the university, mm -hmm. as well as, um, you know, uh, focusing on, on other other relevant issues. Um, she is a, also a working pediatrician, so she does have clinic a half day a week. Right. Um, and I've been uh, really focused uh, more in terms of diagnostic testing and our strategies around um, working towards health equity and the COVID response. Great. Well, let me start here. Not only do you get to deal with a pandemic, but we've got record-setting wildfires and the public health challenges therein. And a listener asked me to pose this question, so if you'll indulge me. With the wildfires in our area, we know that N95 mas masks are the thing to wear, but they're ineffective at uh, preventing virus transmission. Meanwhile, the masks we wear for COVID don't help with smoke. So what's a responsible person to do? So uh, that's a great question. Let me just... Um correct a little bit first. Okay. An N95 um, will actually um, protect you uh, from COVID. Mm -hmm. However, um, we really, because of shortages, recommend that those be used by health professionals. So N95 also, in order to be effective, have to be fit tested. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that can just be slapped on. Okay. Um, but the, the N95 will also protect you from wildfires, whereas it's true that, you know, cloth masks may be difficult to wear during a wildfire. Um, what we generally recommend is that if you don't have to be outdoors um, during this time or if you are an at-risk person being elderly or having underlying cardiac or lung disease, um, the very young, that it's just best to have these mitigating measures to stay indoors and not to be outdoors exerting yourself. Mm -hmm. As you know, some in our county, don't they don't have that luxury. I'm, I'm thinking here of um, essential workers such as farm workers. And so um, the, the numbers of COVID have been, my understanding is they've been quite high among that population during this time. And now they're also exposed to, to smoke. So, you know, it, it, it's great if you can avoid it, but it's not possible. Um, how... Do you have a, a sense of how farm workers are, are faring uh, these last couple of weeks in particular? So, so it is true that there um, a number of our cases have been amongst our most vulnerable populations, mm -hmm. not just you know skilled nursing facilities and long-term cares, but the other biggest group, of course, is essential workers, right. um, especially um, agricultural workers that you know often also don't have the opportunity to really practice the distancing mm -hmm. and mitigation measures that are recommended by public health, we realize that's a challenge, you know, if you're not able to self-isolate. And the county has also been um, providing some outreach into those communities, as well as opportunities to provide places where they can isolate if ill. Right. Um, but it does remain a challenge in terms of essential workers. In fact, we are seeing most of our outbreaks um, in YOLO related to both social gatherings as well as um, essential workers. Mm -hmm. So that's the equity issue you mentioned. Not, not everyone yes, has correct. the same opportunities. Yeah. So we're a little more than five months into the pandemic. From your perspective right now, what is most difficult and what's reason for encouragement? So, you know, I think you're right. Things have been um, shifting so rapidly. It's very hard for the public, you know, to sort of keep up. And mm -hmm. as the science, you know, keeps changing, it may seem that the public health response you know, is shifting, and it's very, it can be very confusing um, that, you know, we really don't have that much evidence yet. So the guidance is based on the best available evidence we have at the time, and then it's subject to change based on new information that's coming in. Mm -hmm. So I do think, you know, one positive thing is that, you know, we are seeing what we hope is a stabilization in our epidemic curve. Um, we are seeing increased compliance um, mm -hmm. with our mitigation measures like distancing, use of face coverings. Um, you know, we are uh, seeing some potential new opportunities for testing on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think those are all positive things. You know, I think the challenges remain in terms of balancing the, you know, the issues we talked about with health equity. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we protect essential workers? You know, how do we address the other potential, 
you know, side effects or adverse effects, so to speak, of the pandemic in terms of, you know, the other health conditions that people um, need to focus on, like mental health, mm -hmm. substance use, you know, after um, hospitals were shut down for some period of time, you know, we definitely saw higher acuity in our emergency departments from people that had delayed care. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a challenge. Um, and then also just the economic impact of, you know, people not being able to work, losing their jobs, losing their insurance. And of course, you know, the impact on education that is expected to be, of course, much more detrimental in our more disadvantaged population. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's a little bit like uh, uh, the Kraken with many tentacles coming at us from many different directions. Um, let, let's talk a little bit more about testing. The, a few weeks ago, the state announced it had uncovered a backlog of testing results that had never been released to counties. And I'm uh, wondering what impact this has had in Yolo County. So, yes, yeah, so there was a very high-level glitch, so to speak, in reporting from the CDPH into the state's uh, main system for managing communicable diseases called CalReady. Mm -hmm. And um, it was not quite noticed at the beginning, but it turned out that uh, ultimately there were nearly 300,000 records that were backlogged, and then it took a couple of weeks to fix that um, so that those records were not being processed. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the main issue was with the electronic lab reporting system. Mm -hmm. So after the couple of weeks you know, that that got resolved, um, we were busy processing the backlog. There was also some challenges in that um, 90,000 positive tests um, that were reported through that system across the state um, turned out to be false positives. They were actually negative tests. Oh. I believe that we've now caught up, um, for the most part, with all the backlog of cases to process. Mm -hmm. um, we still, you know, I think it's important for the public to understand that there's still a general backlog that occurs due to testing delays, mm -hmm. so that the numbers that we're reporting, you know, today, for example, if we look two weeks ahead of time and look back at today, that case um, rate will be higher, mm -hmm. simply because, you know, it sometimes takes a week or 10 days for those um, results to report back to us. Yeah, yeah. I did wonder if that had contributed to the uptick of, of cases in Yolo County we've seen lately. Well, we're hoping that we really, you know, looking at the data, even though we know the numbers, you know, again, are never accurate on the day that we report them, the general slope is going down. You know, it seems like there was probably a peak sometime in mid-July after, you know, after the gatherings of the 4th of July. Mm -hmm, so we're mm -hmm. still very hopeful that we're at least stabilizing or downtrending, but we'll just have to, you know, we're just um, looking at that data for the next another week or so just to make sure that, that we're not seeing an uptick and that this is a true trend. Yeah. I, I know you said Dr. Limbos is the one who's primarily dealing with the, the public health interface with, with the schools, but I, uh, I, I stumbled across a news story today, and I just wanted to bring it forward for discussion. Um, more than, this was from yesterday, more than 560 positive cases of COVID-19 have been reported on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama since classes resumed last week. And the numbers include students, faculty, staff, they're, they're across the board. So this week, as you know, locally we have a lot of uh, students and teachers returning to school. We know that in Davis, we're going to have UC Davis students returning. Many of them, they will be virtual, but many of them will be coming back and impacting the, the town. And, you know, the question I'm hearing most often is when will things be normal again? I know it comes down to metrics, so could you talk about those metrics here in Yolo County and maybe perhaps what's keeping us from progressing if, if we're not? Uh, are, you, are you talking about the county data monitoring list? Yeah. Yeah, so it is true. I, I did see that uh, the news about the um, University of Alabama outbreak. I know there's one going on in Iowa. There's, of mm -hmm. course, the, the UNC Chapel Hill that basically started in person and went back to distance learning within a week. Uh, this is an ongoing challenge, um, to be honest with you. Yeah. Anywhere that you're going to be bringing a lot of people who are congregating, um, especially if, you know, physical distancing, you know, is not being practiced or is not practical, um, then, it is a, then it is a concern. At the county level, we've um, beefed up our infrastructure uh, for contact tracing and investigation, you know, to have a um, team that's uh, specifically focused on schools. Um, however, you know, we do know that that capacity could be overwhelmed pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, we usually only report, you know, 30 or 40 cases a day and obviously an outbreak, you know, of 500 students um, 
is not unimaginable. Mm-hmm. Uh, peer, I do know that the university, you know, is working on a plan to uh, mitigate some of those, uh, some of the impact of that, um, you know, even in the off-campus housing. And so uh, the county is working very closely with the university on their reopening plans right. and, um, and, you know, assistance with contact tracing uh, and other resources from the university. Okay. Um, in terms of the county data monitoring list, so we have been hovering um, somewhere between that 100 and 200 range uh, per 100,000 cases for a while. Um, we think we're settling out you know, somewhere between 120 and 160, but it will be hard to tell until we, you know, look back in time and see where that, that sure. curve is going. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's unlikely that we get off um, that list anytime soon. The CDPH is working on a revised strategy for the monitoring list um, that wouldn't take into account new metrics. Um, however, the numbers um, at which, you know, when we get off the list probably won't really change. And so, essentially, you know, we have to be we have to be below that hundred per hundred thousand um, for at least three days before we can be taken off, and then you have to stay off for fourteen days. And that's the and challenge. It, it seems, yeah, it seems like you know most counties that have fallen below the hundred, they kind of creep back up and get right back on it. So it seems you know that we're pretty stable around <laughs> around those numbers. Yeah. And um, and you know even if we drop below and we're able to maintain for 14 days, um, it's not, you know, it, the state will have to give permission to reopen businesses or to, to, you know, to move towards bringing some of those businesses that are having to do outdoors-only activity indoors. I know there's been a big question because of the fires, you know, and the challenges of, you know, for example, restaurants that have to operate um, outdoors or gyms that have to operate outdoors yeah. in terms of, you know, worker safety. Um, so I think I think there are some real challenges and, and equity issues that we really do have to address, um, but those you know uh, those really are being addressed at a higher level. And um, the counties, while ultimately having um, the opportunity to you know participate in that, uh, ultimately the direction is really being led by the state at this point. Since we talked about the, thank you for all that information. Since we mentioned the university, I'm thinking about the uh, the virus uh, vaccine that's being uh, developed there in in partnership with uh, BioNTech, and all of a sudden it seems like there is a lot of news about vaccine development, which I find encouraging. Um, are you also encouraged by that? Yes, I am encouraged by it. I, I just think we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket mm-hmm. um, because, you know, even once we have a vaccine, it's going to take a real effort to be able to distribute that and, you know, frankly, to convince people, you know, that it's safe and to take it. So, yes, we are very excited. Actually, at UC Davis, we are conducting um, phase three trials for one of the one of the um, vaccines. And so I'm, I'm very encouraged also in terms of a positive uh, impact that we know how to treat this disease or much better than we did at the beginning of the pandemic, that we're learning new things every day. And there are potential other mitigating measures. Although, frankly, right now, most of our solutions are really low tech, like the distancing and yeah. the face covering. And, and that's what it comes down to. Uh, in my opener for the show today, I mentioned that an employee at a local Starbucks drive through mentioned to me that 75% of their customers coming through don't wear masks. And so she feels exposed on a, on a daily basis. She's wearing a mask, but, um, you know, they're in close proximity, e- exchanging cash. I'm not trying to call out Starbucks or anything. I'm just saying we do have a, a persistent problem of, of people, you know, not always complying with, with that, with the, with the low-tech solutions. So um, I want to talk about testing for a minute. I, I'm aware there's a, a test, a COVID-19 testing site starting today at the Davis Senior Center, and I thought perhaps you might want to mention others. And I'd also like to ask you, what would you most like the public to know right now? Yeah, so I believe, um, yes, that's correct, that we, are, um, we have moved the county testing site to the Davis Senior Center, so that's open to the public for anyone that wants to be tested. Um, I believe our media center will be releasing more information Mm -hmm. about additional sites um, that will be coming up. Um, So, um, you know, that will be coming shortly. Um, And we also have, you know, still have opportunities with the the state sites. I do do think that um, we really need to think about, you know, testing. We have seen a drop in, uh, not in our capacity for testing, but sort of in demand for testing. 
you know, we could think that maybe that's a good thing, that there are fewer people that are symptomatic um, that are being tested. But then I'm also concerned that the backlogs and testing delays really impacted people's mm -hmm. perceptions of testing and, and, you know, that that may be leading to a reluctance of testing. So I'm hoping we can address that um, in our long-term strategy for testing soon and really to be able to focus on the vulnerable populations and outbreaks. A related question, because it's come up a lot, I see it on social media, what about antibody testing? Are they available? Are they accurate? Um, and what's the usefulness in people trying to obtain them? So um, there are all kinds of challenges um, and pitfalls with antibody testing. Um, they are available in the commercial labs. They are available in some local labs. Um, in general, it's not recommended um, to use antibody testing other than as a population surveillance tool to find out what percentage of the population might have been exposed. Um, the problem is we don't really know what antibody tests mean at this point. Hmm. You know, there was a recent report from CDC that, you know, there was a reinfection. Um, so we don't know how long antibodies really last. We are seeing people lose their antibodies after two or three months. And the immune response is extremely complicated. So even if you have a negative antibody test, it doesn't mean that you haven't been exposed and may have some immunity from other aspects of your immune system. Hmm. So in an area with, you know, low cases or relatively low cases, you know, that's not in a hot spot. The antibody tests, you know, should not be used for, they definitely should not be used for diagnosis, but they can also be falsely reassuring. Yeah. I think we've debunked the idea of an immunity passport, for example. Right, and it, it further drives home the point that this virus is unlike other viruses we've seen, and this pandemic is a completely unique experience for, for pretty much all of us at this point. So, Yeah, there can be some, you know, even with the antibody test, there can be some cross-reactivity uh, with other human coronaviruses that just circulate generally. Um, so that, that can also be a challenge. Uh, my biggest concern is that they, they falsely reassure people who might, you know, you might change your behavior based on having a positive test because you think you're not at risk. Yeah. All right. I had uh, one final question texted to me, and so we'll, uh, I'll go ahead and ask this, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Does the county health office take action against social gatherings or noncompliant businesses? What should the public do in terms of reporting incidents or violations? So one example is the, the woman I mentioned who works at Starbucks who, who talked to me. Um, what should she do if she's uncomfortable? Yes, so we, we do, um, we have received uh, complaints about non-compliant businesses. We have been focused on um, going, uh, our enforcement team is going out to visit okay. um, those reports. We have found that most of the businesses are actually in compliance, but we have issued uh, warning letters and citations to businesses as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I would encourage, you know, uh, reporting of any, any concerning um, businesses that aren't operating according to guidance. Yeah, I've also heard from local business owners that they do get pushback, people who, you know, simply refuse to wear a mask, and then they simply refuse them entry to the business, and that's that's how it's going right now. So, well, I want to thank you. I know you're a very busy person. Thank you for your time and for continuing to help us um, debunk some myths and put out accurate information. And before you leave, is, the, is there anything you'd really like uh, our listeners to know at this point? Yes, I think, I think from my perspective as a physician and a health officer, you know, we're in it for the long haul. Public health is really here to support the community, and we really want to take an approach um, that is as equitable as possible. Uh, I realize that, you know, everyone wants to go to the back to normal, but this is really a new normal, and unfortunately this virus is going to be here with us to stay for, you know, at least a couple of years. Um, yeah perhaps longer. Hopefully we'll have measures to, you know, mitigate that. And so it is really challenging for people. We do recognize, you know, the need as social beings to gather with other people. But I just implore, you know, be safe out there. If you want to gather, you know, with um, people outside your household, um, please maintain physical distance, use face coverings, uh, don't congregate in large groups. Um, because, you know, the problem is that many people don't realize that they're sick. Sure. Or maybe harboring the infection. And so we really, we really want people just to be safe. And um, please contact public health if you have any questions Great. or need support. All right. Dr. Larissa May, I want to thank you again for joining us today and for your time. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right. Take care. 
All right. In other news, Yolo County residents are advised to be on the alert for scam phone calls purporting to be from their energy provider. According to the AARP, scammers often make utilities a common subject of imposter scams. It's by far the most common type of fraud reported to the Federal Trade Commission. A Davis resident who received such a call recently said the caller apologized for overcharging her on her utility bill, explaining that the charge was from a third-party supplier. She was told to press 1 for a rebate check, but she very smartly hung up, believing the caller was attempting to gain access to her bank routing and account numbers. And Valley Clean Energy, which is Yolo County's public not-for-profit local electricity provider, would like you to know that it never asks for a customer's banking information over the telephone. And anyone who's received such a call recently is asked to contact the District Attorney's Fraud Unit at 855-496-5632 or fraud at yoloda.org. And there's a, they have a complaint form um, online at their website that you can fill out. And I think I've got one minute left. So Yolo County's election office, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to change how we vote this November. So the elections office is planning to place 12 voter assistance centers and 12 ballot drop-off boxes throughout the county ahead of the November uh, November 3rd election. Uh, They're taking input on those sites through August 28th, according to the Davis Enterprise. And you can find uh, information about those sites and uh, at yellowelections.org, and you can submit your comments via email to elections at yellowcounty.org. And again, the deadline for that is this Friday, August 28th, which happens to be my daughter Rowan's 23rd birthday, so I'll give her a birthday shout-out here. All right, thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to the